Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, perhaps we could get this session started. Uh, this is the global value chains. Uh, there will be a couple of sessions, right? Patrick, you're going to do one later on. Uh, but this particular one is continuing a theme that we actually started at the uh, luncheon discussion, which is responding to policy risks. As we can see in today's environment, especially post Lehman 208, uh, governments, I think, well, I have to say from the private sector initiative, are certainly trying to fix some problems. But in the process of fixing some problems, they tend not to look at the whole picture, shall we say, to say it politely. And, uh, and, and could actually be creating a huge amount of other problems in other parts of the supply chain. And indeed, even if massive problems are not created, uh, interesting little things like increasing the cost of doing business is never really a real consideration when people are formulating policy. It's almost like the patients in the emergency room, you've got to stop the bleeding, so don't, let's not worry about the rehab afterwards. And I'm saying, oh boy, you know, the rehab may be a bigger problem than what the patient came into the emergency room to begin with. So that's the basic premise of uh, this particular session in my mind. Uh, I have a distinguished panel uh, to really handle some of these issues so I can sit back and listen and learn. Uh, we have Raju Kanoria from India, my good friend. Uh, Raju is a prominent figure in the global business community having served many years together. Uh, we were together on the International Chamber of Commerce uh, at, at, the, at the international board level. Uh, but, but Mr. Canoria is chairman and managing director of Canoria Chemicals and Industries and uh, have actually recent years even expanded into places in Africa like Ethiopia. And uh, he was a former chairman of FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. And he has vast experience in managing the interface between business and policy at a very senior level. Um, my next panelist is Stuart Harbinson. Stuart is a well-known figure in Hong Kong before he became a well-known figure in Geneva. <laughs> you know, uh, Stuart was a very senior member of the Hong Kong Civil Service and then went on to uh, Geneva. Is now a senior fellow at the European Center for International political economy. I'm happy to say he's also a senior fellow at the Fung Global Institute. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, many years as a public servant in Hong Kong, but his last posting in that capacity was as Hong Kong's rep at the WTO. And then uh, he occupied a series of very senior posts and basically ran the day-to-day -day operations of the WTO uh, for a number of years. Um, so. Very happy to have you on our panel. And then last but not least is Herbert Esquit. Um, Herbert, um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Herbert is the chief statistician of the World, World Trade Organization. And uh, prior to that position, he, uh, he held a number of positions with the UN in different parts of the world working as an economist. He's played an instrumental role in raising the awareness of the need to align trace statistics with the realities of international production arrangements and so on. Uh, I, I've always been told that if you want to do anything concrete in the company, you've got to measure it first. And uh, bad measurements, unfortunately, also lead to bad decisions. <laughs> so, <you>. yeah. <laughs> so this is your job. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then one thing I am very... Um, extremely interested in is I think the whole concept of country of origin as originally defined the WTO is now outdated by what's happening in the real world by the global supply chains. And whether we can switch the whole data gathering and the statistics to measuring some form of value added in the supply chains as opposed to this uh, age old notion of um, substantive transformation <laughs> and charging everything to the last guy who completed the product, I think is something that I might like to raise with you myself throughout our discussion. But uh, let, let's uh, basically kick off, uh, Raju, with you. May I, may I um, actually, 
you know, really, what, what we're really talking about in today's fast-changing world is both the, the factors that are bringing about this change, rapid structural shifts, you know, in the economy, and I think new challenges on sustainability. I cannot point to a better example in terms of social dimension to the tragedies recently that's happened in the garment factories in Bangladesh. It's completely changed the world's view of the social aspects of sustainability, especially in my mind, health and safety. That is absolutely paramount. And that I think should be set apart from all the other issues like overtime and so on, which uh, NGOs have been rightly worrying about, but there is, I think, also, also a bigger issue. Uh, at the same time, um, the technological changes and innovation that we discuss and its impact on, on jobs and so on. Roger, so turning to you in, in this vein, you know, what do you, um, what do you see are the biggest challenges today in light of all these changes? Uh, in terms of managing the relationship between government and business? And of course, the follow-up question is how can it be done better? Okay, Victor, how long do you want the opening comments to be? You want to give the two-minute version or the two-hour version? Neither. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> no, just yeah. take your time. Okay, yeah. no, actually I think I, what I would like to start with is that what in terms of business is an idyllic situation in terms of global value chains. And an idyllic situation would be that we do not need to actually negotiate any agreement and that there is free trade across the world with no tariffs, letting the market determine, assuming that the market is a perfect place which is capable of determining the demand, supply, competitiveness, and every other issue related with it. So the way I look at what we are really discussing today in terms of global value chains is really a distortion which has been created by policy. And that distortion is created by policy because the interests of the world are different from the interests of the individual countries involved in this process of global value chain management. And I think really what we need to do in terms of a very broad perspective is that how do we harmonize the interests which are domestic in nature with the interests of globalization and only then can we have a global value chain system which is completely free from any of these distortions and which will make it easier for companies to decide on the location, on the process, etc. So I, I think what we are really talking is how do we manage these distortions best and those distortions are created largely by policy and policies are worst affected by politics and not so much by local politics. business and it's local politics. So I think at, on one side the world is thinking global but acting local and that's really what we need to deal with. Now what exactly is happening in terms of competitiveness? I think uh, I'm not getting into any statistics or any such thing. We have Hugo <laughs> here who is an expert on statistics but if you look at Asia most of Asia was built on, on export-led economies, including that of China, though China is now reorienting itself to focus more and more on creating domestic consumption. But it was based on export and it was based largely on arbitrage of cost. And that arbitrage was, again, if we distill it down, it was largely wage arbitrage and labor arbitrage. And this resulted in a shift of developed economies into knowledge arbitrage, into higher domestic consumption, into services and such like. Now the way I see it is that the new emerging trend is no longer going to be on labor arbitrage because technological advancement is acting uh, or is actually <coughs> resulting in technologies which do not require physical labor. So much of it will depend, in, I believe, on resource arbitrage on energy arbitrage and also on capital arbitrage. I think money is going to play an important part. And so we, we need to prepare ourselves better in the global value chain in terms of industry and businesses to look at these aspects because they will, so let's take for example the whole energy scenario which has happened uh, as a result of 
shale gas in the US. I mean, in my opinion, 10 or 15 years from now, the US will become a, come back as a manufacturing uh, center. This is my uh, view. And I also, when I talk about resource, I talk about natural resources, about mineral resources and such like. And a lot of policy distortion is, ha is happening because of the control on natural resources. And I think we have to be very, very careful as businesses to select our locations correctly so that we are take full advantage of the resource arbitrage and we don't take it away. I mean, again, to give you an example, in India, we, are large, we became largely dependent on imported coal. And the imported coal prices went up by 25% because Indonesia imposed a 25% export tariff on mm -hmm. coal. Mm -hmm. Now, that changed the entire economics. I mean, it's, it's completely distorted the manufacturing competitiveness. Then, I've already mentioned that global value chains will be driven by local policy. And uh, the kind of protectionism which has come about after 2008 financial crisis is really a cause of concern because many countries are now uh, behaving very differently from the globalization process. Then I think we will also shift away from product specific competitiveness to general competitiveness, mm -hmm. which will be driven by infrastructure, by resource optimization, by capital cost, by transaction cost. For example, when we talk about the negotiation of the trade facilitation agreement, it is probably going to result in significant reduction in, trans in uh, transaction cost and in availability of skills and above all by stable policy. And I think increasingly countries will have to start proving that they have stable policy framework because businesses will fall, I mean, what in my opinion will affect businesses most is the lack of a, mm -hmm. a stable policy. Then I also feel that we, we are getting into a bilateral or plurilateral system of negotiation and shifting away from multilateralism in some ways, though the overall objective remains multilateralism, but it will become increasingly less important to those countries which manage to get into large trading blocks at the exclusion of other countries. So those countries which are left out will have to rethink their strategies as to how they can get back into right. Right. those. Uh, now, a very interesting study which uh, the World Economic Forum had done is on the risks and drivers of global supply chain. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it it breaks it down into uncontrollable risks, influenceable risks, and controllable risks. And then it further breaks it down into environmental, geopolitical, economic, and technological. And amongst those which are controllable, but are some of the highest risks, are the export-import restrictions, the ownership and investment restrictions, and the information and communication disruptions. Amongst the uncontrollable are obviously things like natural disaster, extreme weather, and things like that. And then there are influenceable risks where policy plays a very important uh, part. Where So it talks about uh, things like corruption, illicit trade, sudden demand shocks, and there's a whole list of them. I don't want to go into the details. But I think that's a very interesting study mm -hmm. where I I think all our work should be directed more towards ensuring that those controllable risks are more addressed by businesses. Mm -hmm. You've already talked about rules of origin, so I'm not going to talk on that. But I think there are some new issues which need to be addressed. And those mm -hmm. issues have not yet come on the table in our trade talks. And those are to do with the, not just with financing, but with policy on, monet uh, on finance. Like, fiscal policies of taxation, transfer pricing, right. domicile of companies, capital controls. I think increasingly, as there is less and less tolerance for tax havens and each country is looking to maximize its tax returns, the issues of transfer pricing and taxation are going to become very critical to yes. the global value chain. And I think these need to be simultaneously addressed with other trade issues. Otherwise, 
they will have a, uh, we, we will find ourselves in, uh, in problems. And I know that mm -hmm. in India mm -hmm. we are having huge issues on this. Yes. Huge, huge, yes. huge issues. Yes. So, so actually part of it is also because I have been directly seeing what is, uh, what is happening. And I think also equally important will be also protection of intellectual mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. because the nature of the world, uh, there is a debate on the cost of development versus its social implication, particularly in industries like pharmaceuticals, etc. And I think the social dimension and sustainability which we are talking about also needs to be recognized from the social point of view within the countries in terms of the difference between the rich and the poor. So this gap uh, is also driving a lot of policy change in many, many countries. And, and I know that in India, our fundamental shift uh, from the growth of the uh, decade of 90s uh, has shifted to now a policy on redistribution of wealth without actually mm -hmm. creating it. So I think this, there is a danger of policy being influenced uh, by social differences rather than by uh, merely by business and cost of production. So I think I will stop at uh, this general uh, comment. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Raju. I, I think uh, it's interesting. You started off with uh, thinking about policy as a distortion. You take an, you know, I, I see myself as a multilateralist and free trader. You take a more extreme view <laughs> than, than even I do. So, so really, you, you're saying all the policy uh, uh, initiatives driven primarily by local politics are standing in the way of an unconstrained global optimization. So let me ask you this. Do you think the internet and e-commerce will be the great leveler that would actually re-level re the playing field and get around and, and, and basically mow down, if you would, uh, all these kind of policy hurdles? You see, the way I see internet is it's an enabler for doing business, but it doesn't substitute the physical movement of goods and okay. maybe to some extent services, but certainly not the physical movement of goods. So consumption is not virtual. Consumption is physical and real. So there will still be logistics, there will be still be transport, there will still be customs, there will still be all those issues which whether we like it or not, the internet may only facilitate the manner okay. in which you do the business, but policy will still continue to drive the physical movement of goods and okay. services. So, so you I, think the policy hurdles, the policy yes. distortions will still be will there, still be despite there. the global development of the internet? And they, I, okay. I personally think that. Okay. And another interesting issue before I, I kind of move on to you, sir, is uh, you, know, you, you talked about the uh, transfer pricing issue. I totally agree with you. We're dealing with it on the ground in India. <laughs> you know, I, I think what's happening is the global supply chains as they develop, obviously is reallocating work, reallocating trade. And of course, it's reallocating the tax base. And the local tax authorities obviously have an issue with that and it's reallocated through transfer pricing mechanism. And so for years, the OECD has developed methodologies that most people have adopted are now being challenged by the local tax authorities because they're probably saying, what's happening to my tax base? You know, as these global supply chains begin to develop. But you know, though that, that's another I interesting issue. But I can add a little bit to that. I think yeah. that even the domicile of companies is, well, is actually well, not that's transparent. that's the ultimate allocation, isn't and, it? <laughs> and also when we yeah. add value, yeah. we right. are only adding physical value somehow the value which is added in the form of intellectual property and knowledge is not even being counted. That's right, that's right. So, uh, okay, so that's an, an, certainly an issue that we can debate. Now, Stuart, if I may move to you, I know that you have, a, have had over the years a lot of concerns about the relationship between the multilateral trading system, which I know you fervently believe in, like me, we're part of the converted, and, and uh, how you reconcile all that with the proliferation uh, of the FTAs and the regional arrangements. Uh, and do you think that the, the, these increasing preferential agreements is a source of instability in the global trading system and any risk for business? And, and how do you compare this to other sources of policy risk? 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Victor, and it's, uh, it's great to be back here in Hong Kong. Uh, I should just add one little caveat, which is that as soon as the plane landed, I lost my voice. So <laughs> I hope I can... But I don't, I, no, I think it was because of the plane rather than Hong Kong. Uh, but I hope I can, um, can, can make it through the speech okay. If I cough or splutter a little bit, please forgive me. Yes, um, you, you mentioned uh, rightly the, the role of preferential trade agreements uh, in relation to global value chains. And uh, of course, this, these preferential trade agreements or free trade agreements as people sometimes call them or regional trade agreements, these are nothing new. We've had them for years now. I think at the last count there were some 400 odd um, of these types of agreement which had been notified to the WTO. And um, I think Patrick Lowe issued a report a couple of years ago pointing out that each member of the WTO was party to, on average, 13 uh, FTAs. One, three. Yeah, one, three. Um, so, you know, there's nothing new here. But, um, I mean, I think my thesis would be that we're now beginning to see uh, some new forms of preferential trade agreements, both in terms of uh, scope and scale and depth. These may be driven to some extent by frustration with the inability of the WTO to move ahead with the Doha trade negotiations. Countries get a bit fed up. Uh, of talking and talking and talking in Geneva constantly but not getting any results. So they decide that they will uh, try uh, other routes which they think will be um, uh, more productive. However, um, we are now seeing the rise of what uh, are being called mega preferential agreements, uh, potentially. These are being uh, negotiated and uh, the most commonly cited examples are the of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership here in Asia, and uh, also a mooted Trade in Services Agreement, which is actually being negotiated in Geneva but outside the WTO. Um, and what's interesting about these is that um, they are going into areas which are well beyond current WTO disciplines, areas such as regulatory coherence or convergence into areas like trade and the environment, trade and labor standards, uh, competition and investment. Uh, in other words, um, there's a feeling that the WTO hasn't been able to keep pace with the, these issues, and so the only way to start moving is to start moving off campus, as it were, and in the hope that you can bring them back to the WTO later. But, of course, the, this, this kind of piecemeal approach uh, does present some problems and some, and some policy risks. Uh, first of all, there's no overall framework for coherence of these uh, agreements because they, you know, they go beyond the WTO. Uh, they're not always commercially logical. I mean, if you were if you had a, uh, a global value chain uh, and you wanted to facilitate that, you might not think that the TPP was the best vehicle for that, you know, because of the particular membership of the TPP. Of course, you might find a product that it was good for that, but um, in other words, some of these mega preferential agreements don't always have uh, commercial logic. There are political and strategic considerations which come into play. A third point, uh, which I think Victor has mentioned, a very, very important point, is that these arrangements are not inclusive. In fact, the people who are left out are the small developing countries. So this is going to be you know, a new set of trade rules devised by the big players, which the small guys are going to have to accept later on if we're not careful. Um, so I think the, um, the policy risks for business are um, I would say threefold. First of all, we seem to be creating a patchwork regulatory environment because each of these mega preferentials will have its own kind of way of regulating trade. 
um, and conceivably even competing regulatory systems. It's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out because, you know, the, the membership of a lot of these mega preferentials actually overlaps to some extent. I mean, Japan is a, a member of the, of the TPP. Uh, it's a member of the Trade in Services Talks. It's a member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, but on the other hand, you know, uh, China is, is not uh, in these things. So um, there is a risk, I think, that uh, it's going to be a very, very patchwork system, which is going to make life difficult for business. And in this connection, I mean, I read a report quite recently, you know, about tech, the, the rise of the technology-enabled micro-multinationals, as, as they're called. People who are in SMEs or entrepreneurs who are using the internet for international trade. You know, it could be uh, somebody with a, with a shop in Karachi knocking out a few suits, uh, or it could be anything. And people are actually using the net to trade internationally now. And, but it's very difficult to, house, ha, to see how the SMEs or these individual entrepreneurs are going to be able to cope with this thicket of uh, conflicting regulations. Uh, secondly, I think there's a kind of systemic risk of uh, fragmentation of the trading system. Uh, because if the WTO can't keep up, can't move into these areas like environment, competition, etc., which a lot of people think are very relevant, then uh, we might end up with uh, all sorts of uh, different systems. And that uh, has got to be bad, I think, for, for global trade. And then thirdly, I don't think this new environment of mega preferentials uh, is going to be very predictable um, because governments can chop and change. They can change their mind. It's not a binding system of rules like the WTO. Um, governments may decide to become protectionist. Uh, there may not be a very strong enforcement mechanism in the preferential agreement, which is commonly, commonly the case. Uh, and so, you know, can business rely on this framework? I, I think the answer is, uh, is dubious. So, um, you know, I come back to the WTO as always. Um, uh, because the WTO offers the only truly global uh, platform for creating a level playing field and having the same rules for everybody. Um, the problem is the WTO is stuck, uh, as we know, and they, they appear to be stuck in Bali as we talk, which is extremely frustrating. Uh, but I, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, the ICC and the World Trend Ag Trade Agenda with Victor's very able leadership has been making a start, a very effective start, on trying to get the message across to the WTO members that they really have to get their act together. Otherwise, there are serious risks uh, for business and uh, in terms of global governance as well. And so the, the WTO needs to kind of reinvent itself. Uh, one of the problems Victor mentioned quite rightly is this question of country of origin. I mean, Mm -hmm. Goods are no longer or very, very rarely produced in one country now. They're often uh, the result of uh, processes in several countries. Um, some of the WTO agreements go back to, you know, 1947. Uh, the anti-dumping, the whole anti-dumping phenomenon is based on the idea that a good is made in one country and, uh, and then exported to another country. All of this needs to be updated. Uh, the WTO needs to come to terms with trade in the digital economy. And it needs to get out of this silo mentality where, you know, trade in goods is one thing, trade in services is another thing, when in fact these are so intermingled now in, in trade. So um, <clears throat> we have to get this moving uh, somehow. I think more and more members are, of the WTO are getting alive to this. I know the new Director General, Roberto Azevedo, is aware that this is what needs to happen. Um, <clears throat> a very interesting development recently was that China asked to join this trade in services agreement. Mm -hmm. Now that, that to me potentially, you know, is a game changer because China is basically, by doing that, is, is breaking ranks with its traditional allies uh, in the WTO and coming into a negotiation with the US, the EU and others. 
It's a very, very forward-looking um, move by China. Um, we're not quite sure how this is going to be received yet. Um, the, some of the countries, like the US in particular, I think want to think about that long and hard, which is fair enough. But you know, if, 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 the, if the mold can be broken by countries moving away from the sort of rather rigid framework that the WTO has got itself into, then we could start to see the something much more, start of something much more constructive in the WTO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, thank you for this very timely reminder. You know, I must say, let me just throw in a couple of points in response to what you said. You know, in our enthusiasm to find something that works because of the frustration over the multilateral system, we sometimes really get caught up, you know, on, on the benefits of the you know, what do you call the mega regionals? You know, but, you know, I remember as recently as the 90s where the, um, when, when APEC was prevalent, the biggest fear of the world was the world breaking down into blocks. What has happened to that concern? You know, three blocks. And it, it was partly because of that that we actually, I think, fairly successfully uh, gave an impetus to the completion um, of the previous trade run. You know, so, so I think that, that's one thing. The other, the other thing in, in, in my mind is really the, the, the whole um, idea of creating a economic underclass of economies that are excluded from these. What do you do about the equitable distribution of income on a global basis? What are you going to do with all these people that will be disenfranchised in quotes, not, not part of these big regional, you know, you can't ignore. Because they're gonna, you know, if they're gonna be the have-nots, you can be sure they're gonna make life difficult for the haves. So I, I don't think in, in the euphoria to say we need something because this is not working, the W, the, 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 plurilateral, the, the, the multilateral system is, is not working, we're jumping too quickly into and grabbing on to alternatives and haven't really thought through the consequences of those. And it, 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 it doesn't help that these are politically much easier to sell in the domestic politics. You know, somebody gets off the plane and waves a piece of paper that says, peace in our times. No, I, I, I rest my case. Yes, <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Uh, I do. I mean, one can understand the frustration that people feel with the, with the WTO, but um, it looks like now we're in danger of the WTO being sidelined uh, as the sort of custodian of an outdated rule book. And uh, it looks like we're in the process of possibly moving ahead to design, to design a new global trading system but it might not be a single global trading system. That's the problem. Well, the, the, the best answer in my mind is a veritable revolution within the system itself. What we need is a dramatic updating within the WTO and the rules of the WTO. You know, take the single undertaking, for example. When the GATT was established, we had just 50 economies. Today, we have over 150, almost 160. I mean, is it realistic to think about that as the, 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 the fundamental decision-making rule? So I think, you know, there, there are benefits to that, don't get me wrong, but we've got to think long and hard about the realities of what we're facing today and having an up, the best answer, I think, to this proliferation, you know, I think is the system itself being updated. I, so, I, yeah, I, again, I agree, you know, we, the WTO has got to reinvent itself somehow, and perhaps, you know, the Fung Global Institute and other <laughs> institutes around the world You're can... You're a senior fellow, so can <laughs> ...contribute some thinking in this yeah. regard. Okay, well, let's uh, move on to you, Hubert. I think uh, you, you know more about what you're talking about than any one of us, because you've got the statistics. You know, we're kind of just kind of making comments, you know. So based on what you see, Hubert, what, what do you... What do you Consider the most acute sources of policy risk today. You know, give us a, a, what you see as the landscape. Where could certain dangers come from for us in the business world that, that we're not aware that are in the, pipe, in the pipeline coming down and so on? 
<laughs> OK. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, before coming here, I, I received some instruction by your office. Not the same as what I'm saying. <laughs> More or less, but uh, I was asked not to refer to statistics yes. uh, and to be practical. Okay. Uh, I try not to refer too much to, to okay. statistics. Uh, I'm afraid being French is very difficult to be practical. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, I will treat the subject, but I, I, have a I have a mathematical background, so I, I was asked to, to, to tell a few things about unpredictability in policies and a bit what, what was my, my, my feeling about that based uh, not only on my present job uh, as a statistician at WTO, but having uh, worked as economist in, in developing countries. And I, I, will, I will say that uh, before entering into the details of regulatory uh, uncertainty, which has been mentioned here, I, I would like to put that at a more fundamental level, if you allow me, uh, it, which is linked to, to evidence-based policy making. So something that we statisticians, we say, okay, we produce information in, in order to, to, to feed the politician with the, the, the proper information to make the proper decision. We just forget about something, is that in order to make proper decision based on fact, you need a proper model. And I would like to focus my introduction to the fact that today we lack a, a proper model on the role of global value chain in the international economy. And because we don't have this proper model, we are facing a lot of uncertainty because there is no guidelines. So you don't know what to do with the data you have because you don't have any model to interpret the data or to do forecast. And, and this, is, this is particularly important uh, because we know that policy making is strongly uh, home biased. When you're a politician, when you're a political decision maker, you make your decision in function of your local perception. And the world today I, I like to, to define three dimensions in international trade. The local dimension, the, the thing that you see as, as a local decision maker or a business person. The international dimension is that the perception you have from your local perspective of your uh, relationship with the rest of the world. So uh, you, you, you have your direct business connection, etc. But today, we have a new dimension, which I, I called, or it's called, the global dimension. And there is a difference between the international dimension, which is my international trade with my partners, and the global dimension, which are the, the global results, the, the global impacts of decisions which are made there and there. And this global dimension, unfortunately, is still missing. And um, unfortunately, as I said, I mean, we, we have several competing models. Uh, we have the business model. We have the microeconomist model. We have the, uh, nowadays, uh, the, the financial models. And I would like to comment, I mean, that uh, the Fund Global Institute and WTO produced in June a very interesting book revising I have two microphones. <laughs> Maybe that one's not working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. <laughs> so the, the, this very interesting book, re revising, okay, the, the business approach to global value chain, the, the microeconomic approach to global value chain. Uh, but there's something missing. We, we are missing a, a Newton. We are missing a Keynes being able to uh, wrap up all these views into uh, uh, a global theory of, of uh, what's, what's this new economics. And as long as we don't have that, uh, we are faced with a lot of political uncertainty. And I'm afraid when I visit uh, other developing regions, I guess perhaps Asia is a bit specific, but. I've been traveling a lot in Latin America or, or in Africa, that 
confronted to the reality of global value chains, many economists are still reacting like in the 70s. For example, they, they identify global value chain with multilateral, uh, multinational firms. And they say, oh, this is bad. And if, if I'm a national policymaker, my role is trying to, to restrict the impact of these multinational firms to tax them in order to capture the rent. And I remember when I was a student in the 70s, where you were, um, I was studying the optimal taxation of multinational firms. That, that was the, 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 the core thing of uh, development policy, or to capture the land. <laughs> yeah. And today, when I listen to uh, economists speaking about development and global value chain, I hear we have to capture the value. And I hate this word, capture, because it means that our mindset is still based on the old thinking. So unpredictability will come from the fact that we don't have the big ID. Stanley Fisher this morning was saying that IDs are more important than anything else. And so to, to close it today, I guess that we have to close this uncertainty gap by finding the, the right model. And the Fund Global Institute, not only the institute, but should be very, uh, as a role to play in order to bridge the different approaches you mentioned, mm -hmm. micro, business, etc., but also to work into a, a new global theory. You have to be the new case. And when I say you, it's not only you, Victor, but all, all the people here, in order to, to give the policymaker a good reason <laughs> to be rational and yes. not to react only to the local perspective. Thank you very much, Hubert. I think that was very well put. Let me just respond very quickly, and then I, I'd like to ask Patrick Lowe uh, to, to actually say a few words. You know, I, I think the model is the, the, the idea of capturing rents, the idea of keeping the ugly multinationals out is really a model of the 60s. You know, I think the, the model today is a, what I would characterize as a game of niche hunting. What we've done now is to atomize the supply chains to such an extent that new economies beginning to participate in the world don't have to do the whole thing, but they could do a niche, a very small part of it, and be able to participate. And that allows the um, developing economies to participate in the world order much faster than they would otherwise. If you need to do the entire vertical, let's say just even garments, if you need to go all the way from spinning, weaving, dyeing all the way down to garment making, then you, you got a long, you got a long way to go before you can do anything. So really the, the, the policy issue today in my mind is to look at what capabilities you can offer that are unique, that your niche can fit into what sort of global supply chains, and then connecting and enabling your domestic industry to hook on to those global supply chains. And that really is the game that should be played. It's the game of niche hunting. My capability, where, which supply chains around the world and which part of the supply chain can I hook myself into? And then getting your domestic supply you know, hooked on to the appropriate part of the global supply chains. Now there you need, you need basic enablers. You need IT, without that, you're pretty lost, I think so. So the, but fortunately, the digital divide today no longer exists in my mind because what Sam Pamasano would say, the cost of computing, the cost of it's just gone to zero. It used to be very expensive. So that digital divide has just closed that gap. You know, it's leveled. And then the other one is what I would call modern logistics. It's the idea of being able to infrastructure-wise hook on, you know, to the global infrastructure. You know, getting stuff from here to there just in time is key to that whole process. But having said that, let me now start the conversation with the audience. But I would like to um, give the floor to Patrick Lowe, who is a vice president for research at the Fung Global Institute. We're very proud to have him. But most recently, he was the chief economist 
at the WTO. So Patrick, from your perspective, you've been thinking about these issues for a long time. Yeah, um, I just want to start by uh, challenging something that my former colleague, the Frenchman, <laughs> um, ha had to say. Um, it, I, I don't really understand his point about it being old-fashioned for governments to think about how to enhance the value contribution they can make to value change that pass through their territory. It seems to me to be all about growth, all about jobs, all about looking for opportunities, and I think that fits very well with, uh, with what you just said. So I'm not sure what's outmoded about that particular thinking. Of course, if governments want to my friend Julia won't agree with me on this, but if you want to uh, stop transfer pricing, you better, you better standardize tax rates. For, for Stuart, you've got your ear to the ground um, in uh, Geneva. I'd like to try to understand better why it is that after probably more than a month now, when China said it wanted to join the International Services Agreement, there's still half the people who are in that agreement who don't want China there or at least who are hesitating about having China inside. How would you understand that in terms of what was a professed level of frustration that created the, the, the momentum for having the ISA in the first place? Yeah. I just find this really puzzling because it doesn't seem to me to augur very well for good faith negotiations at a, at a multilateral level. It seems to me there's a terrible deficit of trust which has, which has been building for at least a decade. And that's, I think, something that I, I find deeply worrying. As for the WTO and, and, and reform, I completely agree with Stuart. I think you really do have to think about repositioning the entire institution. There's a literature now about a club of clubs approach where you actually have some discrimination written into it, albeit temporary, albeit conditioned. And then there's this other idea that you can do it by critical mass decision making. Not everyone has to sign everything, but that doesn't mean you discriminate against anyone. Whatever you do, we've got to get out from under the lowest common denominator approach to levels of commitment and scope. Because without that, the WTO is finished. Thank you. Well, you. Okay. Thank you very much. So. Uh, <coughs> Because Patrick asked the question, Patrick asked me also not to mention Keynes nor Marx. I already mentioned <laughs> Keynes, so I will mention Marx now. <laughs> yeah, and well, just to, 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 to illustrate uh, the fact that uh, things that you, you, you try to do locally because you think it's locally good can be globally wrong. Uh, well, Marx said that uh, the, the, the capitalist system was doomed because uh, capitalists were trying to maximize their profit by paying less and less the workers so that they were producing a lot, but nobody was able to buy it. And the, the answer was given uh, for the private sector by Henry Ford, who uh, multiplied the salary of the workers at the Ford uh, firms because saying, my worker are the guys who will be buying the car. And for policymaker, the guy who, who, who answered Keynes' uh, uh, challenge was Keynes, who showed that by, by uh, doing not the obvious thing, in fact, you were working for, for the global good. And I guess that what's missing today is the Henry Ford for the, the business system, because many times global value chain, you try also to maximize your profit, to pay less, et cetera, et cetera, which creates an issue, a global issue, because you need to to have people purchasing your, uh, your goods. I, I looked at some statistics <coughs> before coming here. The, the countries that more benefited from global value chain increased a lot their income, but the, the household consumption didn't follow. The only country which increased is uh, household consumption more than uh, income was Mexico. Otherwise, I mean, China and all, all those countries benefited from global value chain, but less the workers. Mm -hmm. So you need to be the Henry Ford of the 21st century, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will also to say we, we, ha we have to find a case to, to explain to the, the policymakers that I if you take your decision on, only f based on, on the local uh, rational, like if international economy was a win-lose game. What I win is what you lose. We are all losers. And here, there's something that, as I said, is, is missing. 
So it's, it's easy to say, okay, well, we, we, we know that we, we live in a global world, etc. But as far as I know, it was only uh, at, at the peak of the crisis in 2008, 2009, that the G20 took a really coordinated approach when governments started spending more. But once the crisis was away, they came back to their old nationalistic way. And at least I'm convinced this is wrong. I, I'm convinced that global value chain are, are, is not old wine in new bottle. That, I mean, if you, if you pursue import substitution, uh, industrialization, you're doomed. Perhaps big countries like China can do that, but uh, you have only one China in the world. Thanks. Um, I think Patrick was asking about uh, China in relation to the um, trade in services negotiations. Um, well, the background is simply that, that, that um, there were negotiations on trade in services as part of the Doha round. These were always given a, for, for reasons which mystify everybody. These were always given a very low priority. Things like agriculture were considered to be a bit more... Um, politically important for, for, for various reasons. So uh, a number of the kind of more service-oriented economies said, well, you know, to hell with this. We're going to go outside the WTO and uh, we're going to, you know, negotiate an agreement amongst ourselves. Um, there's some 20, 21, 22 economies like this. Hong Kong is one. Um, the US, the EU, Japan, etc. And the idea was to have this, uh, it could either be a kind of prototype agreement which could be then brought fully into the WTO and people could be asked to sign on to it, like um, uh, sort of the sort of critical mass arrangement that Patrick mentioned, or it could be a free trade agreement, another, yet another free trade agreement outside the WTO. So um, uh, when this first happened, China was pretty negative and said that, that this is not the way to go, uh, you know, we must negotiate multilaterally or not at all. Um, but very interestingly, and perhaps in the light of domestic political uh, and policy uh, considerations, uh, China uh, a month or two ago came forward and said it would like to join this group of 20 odd countries which are negotiating trade in services which, as I said, is a, you know, is, is a, was, a, was a real um, um, mold breaker in terms of the WTO because yeah. China always sided with India yeah. and uh, developing countries and et cetera, et cetera. So to come out and say, yeah, I would like to work with these developed countries on services was quite something. Um, some of the participants in this negotiation, such as Australia, uh, came out immediately and said this is an excellent thing and we must get China on board as soon as possible. I think the US um, and Canada to a lesser extent uh, said, oh, well, this, is, uh, this is something new, we need to think about this. Um, there may be a need, I think, for some consultation with the Congress um, under US procedures as to whether they can negotiate with somebody. There's usually a 90-day period of consultation, I think, in, in Washington. But the kind of feeling was that, you know, China hasn't really um, uh, delivered the goods in the Doha round, and so we're a bit cool on this. So the answer from the U.S. is very cool, actually. Yeah. You know, so let me just add something to this. Perhaps people are not aware of the internal dynamics within China with regard to services. Yeah. If you, you know, China, China has always been an economy that is basically have a much, very low emphasis on services. China, only 43% of GDP comes from services. And that is very low even for developing countries, which is in the 60s and, and, and more. However, I, I think there is now a huge focus on developing the services sector as opposed to manufacturing. And if you look at the current 12 year, uh, the, 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 the 12 five year plan uh, that we're in the second year of, one of the chief huge objectives is to move the services sector from 43% to 47% of GDP, four percentage points in five years, which is a huge move for the Chinese economy. And if you look deeper, the, 
that what's really happening is again jobs. Um, this whole idea of rebalancing of the Chinese economy away from export towards domestic consumption, you're going to be dealing with at least 150, some would say 200 million workers who are actually participating in the, yes, low value added, but it's in the, the export economy. And somehow, you've got to actually find jobs for them. And the only way to create jobs really in, in big numbers would be to develop the services side so that it could absorb. So my own view on how fast China is able to rebalance actually depends on how rapidly they're able to create the services sector. And, and, and then the realization, as everybody is doing now, is services could be embedded services in products, et cetera, et cetera. The export of services is a completely new game. So I think China is now a wholesale uh, flop, if you would, to actually wanting to do more in services. In, in fact, if you look at the global situation, people used to think that the jobs are created in the manufacturing sector, and that's in what Mike Spence would call the tradable sector, and that's under a lot of pressure. What you really need to do if you want to create domestic jobs that could be protected would be jobs in the services sector in the non-tradable side of the economy. That's really where the permanent job creations could be had. So there's a huge sort of reorientation towards the services sector in the whole world. And I think people should realize this. It used to be the province of the developed economies. Yes. And this divide that you talked about, whenever the developing economy services, it triggers the response, oh, this is the, uh, this is the Singapore you know, uh, agenda, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. You know, and boom. You know, but really, the developing countries are now beginning to realize the importance of the services sector, especially non-tradable sector, domestic, for the job, job creation side, and the need to actually do that. So I, I think the, the dynamics are shifting, and one, one should really realize that. OK, let me now open up to the, I had a hand, Tariq uh, Rangumwala from Pakistan, my good friend. Thank you for joining us, Tariq. And you have the floor. And then I, a couple hands here. You yeah. need me to stand? Oh, oh. yeah. Victor, I, I, since we have the gentleman from the statistics of the WTO, <laughs> you know, um, I was wondering how, what percentage of the world trade is already in-house, MNC-oriented? Um, you know, there, there's a percentage, I understand, where it's the in-house transfer of trade, basically, within corporates. Uh, there's, a, there's a big substantial percentage, which is the intercorporate transfer of trade. And similarly, in the definition, because, uh, you know, when Victor was talking about MNCs, there is a view, of course. I mean, for some of us, an SOE or an MNC is about the same because they take no prisoners. But that's besides the point. Uh, I mean, the, on this side of the spectrum, in the definition of services also, we are, we, are, we are facing issues in what you define as services and what we perceive as services. There is cultural issues also, which have an impact on trade and in perception of trade, which needs to be extrapolated within the negotiation. I, I, I don't want to open all of that. I just want to know what is intercorporate transfer as a percentage of world trade, which is really a very key uh, indicator for us, because the rest is then what is left as what we would call free trade. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the precise answer to your question, I don't know, because still, uh, I mean, being able to track trade within uh, uh, related firms, which is the, the technical definition of that, is, is still one of the project of the international statisticians. And we, we had a meeting uh, with the United Nations Statistical Commission uh, a few weeks ago to, to to see how it would be possible to, to develop this kind of thing. For the time being, this kind of information is mainly restricted to, to the OECD area. And according to the OECD, so I mean, it's, they are not data I, I manage myself, uh, it, it will be around 55% of uh, trade. Um, this is within. Uh, if we, we look at trade 
where at some point uh, multinational firms are involved according to UNCTAD, so I'm, I'm delivering another data which is not WTO, they say it's about 80%. But uh, as I said, I mean, we, we are still at the beginning, uh, from a statistical perspective, uh, you have to realize that this, this issue was captured by the radar of international statisticians only five years ago. When, when, for, for those who know uh, how international statistics move, I mean, the, the, the Doha negotiations are fast compared to, to international <laughs> statisticians. <laughs> and I will say that it, it's a miracle that in, in just five years, we were able to start from scratch to, to a situation where the United Nations Statistical Commission decided to, to, to analyze the, the, the issue and, to, and to, to, to look at what has to be done. But for the time being, uh, we don't have the, the number. But it, it's, about, it's about this. No, no, no. <laughs> let, me, let me give you another data point, Terry. For China, I, I know there's been a lot of uh, estimates and statistics done. 50% of China's exports are due to the, this transfer idea that you just mentioned. Multinationals investing in China and re-exporting to their own subsidiaries overseas. So for the China data point, it's about 50%. But this raises another side of the coin, and that is how the foreign direct investment is intimately related with trade flow. You see, if you open up to FDI, you're actually creating jobs and also re-exports. And that's how you actually even think through the whole question of market access for developing countries. Yeah. You see, uh, because the entire world based free trade system is based on the entrepreneur, the individual who is the entrepreneur. And yeah. as you can see in the digital society, how the entrepreneur is directly engaged. But what is the difference between a non entrepreneur led institution who's supposed to represent a free market situation sure. and a state owned enterprise where sure. the engagement of the entrepreneur is not direct? Uh, and therefore, you know, it leads yeah. to a lot of uh, uh, mis, uh, how do we say, uh, sure. you, know, uh, you know what I mean. Corporate governance yeah, issues. Corporate governance <laughs> yeah. There's no okay. because there's no entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that was what the fight was all about. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, I, I understand, Trey. Thank you. David Dodwell. And then there's a hand back there. Yep, okay. Mr. Miller. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Victor, and most interesting uh, set of discussions. I would push back a little, on, first of all, on, on what was just said, in that um, um, if you take a company like Astra, operating as a multinational in Indonesia in the motor industry and so on, they're using 1,400 SME companies to supply them along their production chain. So I don't think you can sort of put big, nasty multinationals no. on one. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, but secondly, also, another data set, which uh, I'd be interested for, for uh, Hubert to talk about, is the Tiva database, which is starting to break down the value chain. And it's looking not at what multinationals account for, but uh, trade in intermediate goods. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think that's perhaps a more useful measure of, of uh, of the extent of, of the, the globalization of the supply chain that we're working on. Um, the, the point that I had wanted to raise originally was picking up from Victor's uh, uh, point about China and its sort of getting religion, certainly about uh, services. As I'm heavily involved in the APEC process and we'll be up in Beijing next week for the, uh, for the meeting where China lays down on the table its plans for next year when it chairs APEC, services are going to be significant in that and we'll learn for the first time in some detail I think what their agenda is for services liberalization. Um, that I think is significant but what you haven't noted which is equally significant from my point of view mm -hmm. is in Indonesia. Uh, Chati Basri, the finance minister, I think shocked a lot of us down in Surabaya in April when he addressed a very large uh, audience of Indonesian business people where he said we have to liberalize our services economy because 
services costs in this country are so high that our manufacturers are not competitive and we are going to remain consistently vulnerable while we carry these high services costs. And he took the message straight to their own manufacturing economy in an economy that would traditionally be put in the, the conservative camp. It was a very shocking, very, very in, encouraging uh, contribution. Uh, so it isn't just China. You can't neglect okay. Indonesia either. But yeah, by, by the way, I, I should add that even in China, log the, the, the cost of distribution and logistics cost is also a main driver of service development. Because the Chinese economy, the logistics, well, the, the US economy, for example, the distribution cost is less than 10%. For the Chinese economy, it's almost 20%. So there's a huge drive from <coughs> Beijing to see how you can lower that for a more efficient distribution, and it's all going into the services sector. But before I go to Tony Miller, I'd like to hear from you, Raju. How does the Indian economy look at this whole issue of services? Are these things that we're talking about applying to the Indian situation? Oh, very, very relevant <laughs> in my opinion. I mean, to give you one statistic of, you're talking about 10% in the US and 20% in China. Yeah. Well, let me tell you that uh, from my factory, which is 700 kilometers from the port, it cost me more money to transport from the port, uh, from the factory to the port than the from the United port to the United States of America. <laughs> so. I think this is a serious issue in India, and we need to address it. And mind you, much of it is not merely a lack of infrastructure. I mean, the lack of infrastructure is one aspect which is there. I mean, the road conditions, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what we don't realize is the fiscal system in India is actually we are talking about FTAs and PTAs and so on. But we are not talking about an Indian economic union. I mean, we really don't have an Indian economic union. Because in order to transport these goods from one place to another, I have to pass through three states. And at every state, the trucks are stopped because there is an entry tax or an octroi or some such sort of thing. So actually, ranging between 8% and 17% is what we are adding purely in terms of fiscal cost, not the transportation cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think we have some serious issues here to address. One more point I'd like to address here, which is somewhat unrelated, but uh, we talked about transfer pricing. The New Companies Act in India requires, and this is the point which Tariq was raising on transfer to intercorporate or to related party, every transaction will require an approval under the New Companies Act. Every transaction will require an approval of the general body. Yes, sir. In, and I'm telling you this, Victor, because you are present in India, and we are seriously concerned about this because this is an absolutely ridiculous provision. You're not so, making you know, my day. You know, the point which I'm trying to make is the point which I made about local policy, which is going to affect global value chains. I mean, we are going to drive ourselves to the ground because we are not in tune with, uh, with planning for anything for the future. So, so we are really, you know, from, on the other hand, we are extremely well equipped in IT. We are extremely well equipped in our virtual infrastructure. Uh, I mean, our rules for e-commerce, et cetera, are pretty much liberal. But it's this entire aspect of physical trade which, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm extremely bothered about India. And many of the comments which I had <laughs> made are obviously related to my own experiences uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our country. And I really don't know where we are heading because much was talked also about what you said, have and have nots. So have and have nots are driving policy. I get your point. Yeah. <laughs> Tony. Well, thanks, Victor. This is uh, really just building on a point that uh, David Dobwell um, alluded to on statistics. So another question for Hubert. There's a fair amount of work being done in recent years on breaking down the value added each stage in a, a multinational uh, production chain. Um, is the data yet in a condition that institutions like the WTO or other multinational, multilateral institutions could publish it alongside traditional data? Because obviously at the aggregate level, it totally overturns normal perceptions, traditional perceptions of the, uh, the balance of trade. 
it strikes me that this is one way of dealing with the problem you alluded to earlier of educating policymakers that the manufacturing world has changed around them some time ago. Thank you. Um, thank you. <coughs> the, um, for statisticians uh, working in international organization, we, we make uh, an important and political distinction between official data that are recognized by government and research data. So, uh, where, uh, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, international statistics is, is, is the closest thing to, to international diplomacy I know. You have to be very careful what you say and what you publish. So, uh, with, with the OECD, we released uh, in January this year the, the first uh, trade in value added uh, database. We, we are now covering 57 countries, and we plan uh, next year to, to, to include more developing countries. So we, we are including the OECD country plus the, the emerging countries. And those data are not official, so they are research data. And uh, we, we are not exactly competing with trade statistics in the sense that our information is more at industry level and we are very aggregated. So we deal with agriculture, we have textile and, and um, apparel, etc. We don't enter into the detail of, of uh, trade statistics. But the, the main purpose, and uh, here I mean I, I fully concur with uh, what you said, that, that our main purpose was really to show that uh, today uh, jobs in, in, in uh, one part of the world are closely related to demand and activity in another industry in another part of the world. So our next step with the OECD will be to move from value added, which is uh, an economic concept, to jobs. Because when you have the value added uh, and, and the sectoral data, you are able, provided that you have, you have the information, to, rely, to, to relate that to jobs. And we really want to, to improve our coverage of developing countries because we really think that we, we have to sell the message to, to many developing countries in Africa. I mean, Africa is still absent from our database. Or to Latin, to South America, that uh, trade doesn't destruct jobs. I mean, you are in Asia, perhaps you don't realize, I mean, the, the kind of mindset you may find in, in other uh, region of the world. And I will say, unfortunately, in Europe today, uh, also, we, we are back to the, to, to the 60s where uh, more and more uh, you have this kind of populist uh, vision. So we have to show that trade, and glo trade along global value chains is a win-win game. In order to do that, we have to, to speak about jobs because today jobs is everything. And, but uh, next year, I hope... Uh, if I'm here to, to be able to, to speak more about that. But the, the, the data are already available on the OECD data sets, fully away, uh, it's free, and uh, I mean, happy to, to speak about that on bilaterals. Well, thank you, Hubert. I think, uh, you know, we've come to the end of our session. I, I'm very, very aware of the fact that we may be overstaying our welcome and running into other sessions. I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, for participating. I think we could continue this for a long, long time. You can see the types of issues that we're really dealing with now in this aspect of the work of the Fung Global Institute. We will really want to take a lead in terms of looking at the future development of the WTO, uh, the, um, the preferential trade agreements, and how that all works together, and the whole idea of, you know, the statistics, the, the idea that I, I'm really very mindful of the fact that the trade statistics do not tell the story today about what's really happening to trade, what's really happening to job creation and value creation in the world. And we've got to really align that because we're making more and more policy decisions on the basis of what I see to be totally inaccurate, if not incorrect data. So thank you very much for participating.
economics. 